So let's start with talking about the five ways people get stuck in narcissistic relationships. Even when they're like, I know this isn't healthy for me. I know this isn't good for me. Let's talk about the five traps. Yeah. Hope, fear, guilt, pity, and believe it or not, comfort. <laughs> start with hope. The hope is this is going to get better. Maybe if I wait another year. Maybe if we wait for them to get a promotion. Maybe if we make a little bit more money. Hope, hope, always almost future faking yourself, right? You keep moving your own goalposts. And it doesn't help that they're doing it too. They're like, give me another year. Give me another six months. I'm going to go to therapy. I'm going to... No, they're not. I just want to highlight that frame you said. It's so good. Future faking yeah. yourself. So, and that's worse than someone future faking you because now you're, you're almost like falling into the same vat with them of saying, I'm going to give it this much time or maybe after the, no, mm -hmm. today, you're going to judge today. Okay. So that's the hope. The fear people have is the fear of being alone, the fear of having to start again, the fear of um, doing things on their own, the fear of what if I'm wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, what if they actually do change? What if I, maybe it was going to happen in six months. So there's a lot of fear. Okay, the guilt. One thing we talked about in that first episode we did together is not all narcissism is the, the big peacock strutting around so grandiose. Mm. In some cases, the narcissistic presentation is really vulnerable. It's, they're very socially anxious. They're always a victim. You always need to rescue them. So people sort of feel a sense of guilt of like, I'm not a mean person. I'm a compassionate person. I don't want to leave someone when they're down. Well, they're always down. Mm. So it's never going to be the right time. But that last piece that, piece, that comfort piece, is challenging too because we really do gravitate to that which is familiar even when it's traumatic. Mm. And so that idea of trauma bonding, you keep having the same arguments but they're familiar arguments, that's very much the trauma bond. The justifying all the time, the think, using sort of magical terms like, I don't know, it's just something, I can't describe why I like them. I'm like, if you can't describe <laughs> why you like them and you're using all this magical talk, then there's something wrong here. Tell me why you like spending time with this person. I know it's a narcissistic relationship, but people are like, I don't know how to describe it. It's just like this magic, and I don't know how to describe it. I say, you don't know how to describe it because it's not healthy. Interesting. Why is that? Can you go deeper and explain So this that? It's a big part of the trauma bonding experience because it's so primal, right? Mm -hmm. Is really someone going to say, you know why I like being in this relationship? Because they remind me of my invalidating mother. And they, the, the, the reminder of my invalidating mother is really just such an interesting place for me to work things through. They ain't going to say that, <laughs> right? So they're going to say, I don't know how to describe it. It feels sort of magical. And I'm like, oh God, no, no, no magic. I want to hear respect, kindness, compassion, similar values, similar Ooh. interests. I feel safe. I want to hear that stuff, yeah. okay? So all of that stuff, though, in a trauma-bonded relationship, sadly can feel like comfort mm -hmm. because familiarity is one of the greatest comforts of all. Think about it. You go back to a hometown, even if you never want to live there again, there's a comfort in knowing almost intuitively the turns and the road and all of that stuff, right? We are it's, soothed by comfort. It's the phrase, the better the devil you know. Yep. And then and the biggest trouble you have, basically. Mm -hmm. So the, all of that stuff keeps people stuck, okay? But even once people recognize that and they're like, no, oh, despite all of that, I'm going to do the courageous thing. I'm going to step out of this. Then they step out. Okay. A couple of things happen. Most classically is the phenomenon of hoovering. Now, hoovering, and you know this as a Brit, is a vacuum, yeah, yeah, right? So you yeah. know it better this than Americans. Like, Americans are like, hoovering. It's, it's, it's a vacuum. Yeah. So it's sucking someone back in. Mm. And hoovering is a common narcissist tactic. Now, not every narcissist hoovers. Sometimes they move on into their own future thing without you. But many times they do. It's a power play. It's a dominance play. Mm -hmm. It's a way for them to feel in control. It's game playing. It messes with your mind. It's manipulation. But hoovering is when the person's left. They're already struggling with the hope, the fear, the guilt, the pity, the trauma bondedness, all of that. And then the narcissist, I don't know, two months out, three months out, even three days out, texts like, hey, babe, I miss you, or like, been thinking about you. And this, this sort of the fantasy version, that love bombing version of the narcissist mm -hmm. sort of starts to emerge again. And you think, 
oh yeah I was right. yeah I was right see hope mm -hmm. and in fact some people when they step out enjoy that sense of power of like oh if I step away from them then they become nice again and that's a trauma bonded dance in the relationship out of the relationship mm -hmm. in the relationship out of the relationship recognizing that the narcissistic person loves games in relationships they love the chase they love the hoovering cycle so some people really can get very vulnerable to getting sucked back in and almost enjoying the having the narcissist trying to win them over well, as soon as they get them back in they discard them it's like a child with a toy they don't really want they just wanted to get it away from their brother or their sister right so th that hoovering trap is a big one for someone to be resistant to because every trauma bonded cell in their body is saying I want to go back oh you know and you have to say no 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 it, it's almost like don't walk towards the light in this case like walk the other way <laughs> whatever the other way is and so that's a huge risk, okay? But then we have to add into that, Lisa, things like societal pressures. And this is where we talk about enabling. The enablers, to me, in many ways, are as dangerous as the narcissist. The ones who are like, oh, they're not so bad, or you just mm -hmm. gotta give them a chance, or come on, the devil you know. And they'll say things that will not only attempt to sort of downgrade the harm the narcissist is doing, but then leave the person who wants to step away from the relationship feel shamed, foolish, like they're making a mistake. Because that person who's leaving the relationship is already struggling with that. Right. So if the enablers mm -hmm. are stepping in and they're saying like, oh, you sure you know what you're doing? Then there, there's already so much doubt in the mind of the person leaving. So now this enabler is pouring all this new doubt in there. And again, there's a lot of shame around that. Like, who am I to think I could step away? Because narcissistic abuse really undoes a person, leaves them feeling like they're not enough, leaves them feeling like they're, they're full of self-doubt, they're confused, and they really start believing, like, who else will have me? Who cares who else will have you? We just want to get you away from that person. But the enablers can really do a number on a person, as well as society. You know, like, um, we're making this episode around the holidays, right? And so you gotta be, you can't be alone during the holidays. I can't tell you how many people got stuck in narcissistic relationships for another six months because it was the holidays and they didn't want to stay leave because of the holidays. And I'm like, oh my gosh, just go get drunk under a tree somewhere. But like, <laughs> please don't let this be why you, you, you end up signing up for more. So you can see that there's, it's society, it's enablers, mm -hmm. it's your own demons. All of that colludes to make not only leaving, but even walking that first block out of the relationship really, really difficult. I love how you frame it and then also like I would love to get some like real tactics because mm -hmm. I'm always that person where like if I'm emotionally not feeling mm -hmm. like if I'm feeling vulnerable mm -hmm. I need tips and tactics to actually either do or say mm -hmm. in those moments to not then just let my heart mm -hmm. follow mm -hmm. um, get hoovered back in mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. so I actually want to start with hope because what are the language that people say that narcissists will say to you um, to bring back that hope that you can kind of um, be wary of that becomes a flag. So for instance, I know that you've said when someone says to you like, oh, um, don't, it's never gonna happen again. So things like that, mm -hmm. what are the things that they're using to um, trigger your hope? It's never gonna happen again. I'm gonna go get therapy. Give it another, give me another six months. This has just been a rough time. Um, the holidays are tough for me. Valentine's Day is mm. tough for me. Your birthday is tough for me. My birthday is tough. They'll keep lin linking it to anniversary dates, holiday dates, mm. and say, let's just get through this holiday. Let's just get through the summer. Let's just get through the fall. Let I'm like, okay, we've got all four seasons, so we're just <laughs> going through. Right. So it's always this idea of let me get through this review at work. Mm. Let me get through this deadline. Um, so in essence, you're always being put on ice, mm -hmm. right? That's how future faking, but that's how the hope gets cultivated. They, Cause they're saying like, I'm aware there's an issue, right? So when somebody says that to you, mm -hmm. I'm aware there's an issue that fosters your hope, but basically mm -hmm. they're saying, and you're not important enough for me to adjust that right now. Oh my God, that's so true. And then thinking about, I know a lot of women that have been hurt and um, are wounded and mm -hmm. so they look for that in a partner mm -hmm. because they feel needed mm -hmm. I can help fix them. yeah 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 so yeah. even with with the guilt part I think that how, how does someone work through that 
that might be one of the hardest things of all to work through, right? Because especially when you're dealing with somebody who's a very manipulative, vulnerable narcissist, they use their victimization as a tool. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, nothing ever goes my way. and Life is so unfair to me. And, you know, I can't, you know, how is ever going to want to be with me? Now, often even a vulnerable narcissist, their tactics are interesting. They'll even put themselves down. Like, oh, if you leave me, who's ever going to want mm -hmm. me? And if, some, if they're with somebody, and usually vulnerable narcissists are with rescuers and fixers, right? They're not the big, flashy, grandiose narcissists. These are the ones who are getting very victim, very sullen, very resentful, very angry and brooding and all of that, that the rescuers will feel like, oh, God, like this is this poor person. And so it really is the work then becomes is to say your empathy and compassion are such beautiful things. Mm -hmm. However, I want us to take a minute and really list all of the unhealthy patterns in this relationship. Because what's happening is you're basically staying in something that's noxious, that's unhealthy. It's almost like being next to like a chemical dump site and smelling in all the chemicals or next to someone who's smoking a cigarette or something and blowing the smoke towards you. That's not good for you. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of helping someone see that you can retain your empathy and compassion and you can also preserve yourself and your job on this earth is not to rescue another capable adult. That responsibility lies on them. Wow, that was so amazing. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Because I really do worry about those situations where people do just take it on themselves as mm -hmm. their responsibility. And you're 100% right that they'll lock it away. Like the phrase that came to mind is you, tr you teach people how to treat you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that phrase really hits me. And so when I think about things like that, it's like you mean so well. And that's the thing, right? People mean well. Right. And that phrase, though, Lisa, it's tricky. You teach people how to treat you because so many people were never taught how to be treated. Ah. You see what I'm saying? So I think that there's a real risk with that one because many people came from homes where they were invalidated as children, mm -hmm. where they were not valued, where they had no empathy shown to them. It came from family systems characterized by narcissism and antagonism and high conflict personalities. So nobody taught them. Mm -hmm. So this idea of they don't know how to teach someone else because they themselves uh -huh. don't know. I'm not even going to say they're teaching people. One of the key elements to remember about the narcissistic relationship, it's why currently the world of mental health is not serving this group of people who's going through narcissistic abuse well. Mm. We make it all about responsibility and we put all the responsibility on the person going through narcissistic abuse and they're already blaming themselves. But mm. the person who's behaving badly really is the narcissistic person. Right? right? And since the world is telling this person in the relationship, maybe you shouldn't leave or everyone deserves second chances or why don't you forgive? They're getting that message messaging. Mm -hmm. They themselves are confused. They've been gaslighted. They've been manipulated. They think all of this narcissistic person's behavior is their fault. Right. So you feel like that framing actually, they, 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 they will take on the blame, which Correct. obviously doesn't serve them. Correct. Yes, so I think this mm -hmm. idea that they have this person in the narcissistic relationship mm -hmm. thinking that they can take all this responsibility and have all this power, mm -hmm. they actually can't and don't mm -hmm. because this is so manipulative. Right. And even the mental health profession will say, well, like, well, what's your role in this? I said, there. this is like saying what someone's role is. Somebody gets punched in the face and said, well, does your face really need to be in the way? <laughs> Do you want to know the key signs to spot a narcissist? Click here right now. Tell me the story of you. Tell me how you spend your days, okay? You ask those two questions, you're gonna get a lot of data. Pay attention. The other thing you need to pay attention to, this third thing's not a question. It's how, do you, how are you feeling?